Hello, and welcome back to this episode of Five Alarm Task Force, if you're listening to the audio. But if you're watching our video, welcome aboard. Glad to have you with us. I am your host, Steve Green. Happy to be here with you and happy to have you here with us. And I am so pleased to bring today's guest to you. If you missed him about, about 19 months ago, this is Chris Kessinger. He was a career lieutenant with an Ohio Fire Department, and he has been working in the fire service for 19 years. Chris believes that everyone must be a lifelong student of the craft and love this blue collar job, no matter what color shirt you're wearing. It makes no difference wearing a shirt and tie. If you love being a firefighter, career, volunteer, part pay, whatever, you gotta love this job and love what we do for this job. He, Chris also serves as the lead instructor and owner of Citizens First Fire Training. In addition to the role of training officer and instructor for numerous schools, training facilities and departments. In addition, he is also a member of the Central Ohio Fools chapter. His heart will always be with truck company ops. Chris is a nobody from nowhere, although I don't want to go with really that description after seeing how he's done so well since he was last with us. And he just loves this job and spreading the passion for it everywhere he goes. Our citizens are our first priority. And we must always remember our mission and that they are number one. Chris, welcome back. It's great to have you back with us. Oh, thank you for having me on, sir. So I, you know, when I reached out to you, um, I, I didn't know that you had taken the company full time. And I am so glad and proud of you for doing so. Thank you. It was a big step. Uh, we talked about it for a while and I was at that step to either somebody else had to come in and start doing stuff full time or I needed to make that transition. And I thought it was better if I did it so we can keep focusing on our mission and keep going forward. And I, I think, you know, as we said at our very first meeting, that this is, is and was at that time, but still is today, such a refreshing philosophy to have in today's fire service. And I think it's so important for our listeners, many of whom are in the fire service, others are buffs, others are in other first responder uh, positions. But the fact is, no matter which branch of first responder we're in, we have to remember the words that you live by, which is that the people who live in our communities that we protect are always our first objective. That's what we have to remember, and that we have to we have to always stay top level in our skills to be able to serve them correctly and as per our oaths. Absolutely, uh, there's a lot of distractors in today's society with the fire service, especially as our missions continue to grow, staffing continues to shrink, budgets continue to not support fully what our mission is, and it's easy to lose sight of what our priorities should be and what we need to be focusing on. It's easy to get complacent if you're not in a motivated house or you get into slumps during your career and being able to have that mission reset, remember our why and get back to it is critical. Very, very true. You know, you bring up a, a very good point too. This philosophy of citizens first is does not have to be unique to career departments. This should be Every firefighter, whether they're career, volunteer, part pay, WUI, if you don't have the passion for the job and you don't have that burning inside, pardon the pun, but to continue to learn con consistently. You know, we talked about this the first time. We're both educators. I'm a lifelong educator mm -hmm. for over 50 years. And when we met, it was so refreshing to see someone of your age group who is believes so ardently in the concept of honing our craft continuously. Because if we don't, then we're not serving the people who pay us in our departments or contribute to our departments or depending on us for their very lives and safety. Absolutely. The big thing is the citizens don't care if you're paid combination, volunteer, if you're an EMT, if you're a paramedic, if you're a first responder, level one, level two fire, they don't care. They expect no matter when they call that we show up, they assume that we have the same staffing, 
as big cities, the same budgets, the same training across the board, and they expect us to fix whatever their problem is. So to me, it doesn't matter if your career, your volunteer, what your status is, time on the job, it's being able to be a professional, continue to train and be able to execute to save that. The big thing is with volunteer departments, you typically have a higher potential of responding to your own family. So you can be the difference in whether one of your family members lives or dies. That's a great point. And, you know, I think it sounds like you're almost channeling two of our greatest leaders in the, the fire service that I've known since I got into it back in the mid seventies. And that is the late chief Bruno and chief Bobby Halton, because both of those men absolutely believed in the fact of continuous education and training. Mm -hmm. And Absolutely. for one purpose, and as Chief Bruno may rest in peace said, is that our job is to take care of Mrs. Smith on her worst possible day, mm -hmm. even if that worst possible day for her is simply for us, her cat in a tree. Absolutely. They don't call us on good days. It's right. the worst day of their lives, the worst emergency that they've been through. And unless the person's going to jail, it falls to the fire department to be able to fix that problem for them. And we have to remember that. That's a great, that's another great point. So let's refresh for our newer viewers uh, and listeners. What brought you to create Citizens First, even when you were still uh, working for a department full time, you still devoted, other than your family, all the rest of your time to your company? Absolutely. Uh, <laughs> devoted a great majority of the time uh, trying to build it. And it started off just teaching classes locally with Fools chapters, with other departments, stuff like that. And it started growing into more. And we've continued since then to expand as a company. And our biggest thing was being able to give back, to be able to train, to reignite the passion in members that have never had the passion or have lost it during their career, to be able to show the importance of what training is, to be able to build the team, to get that spark back in your career, and to be able to make a difference to reduce civilian fire fatalities, to be able to save your own guys, and to be able to get that back and take knowledge and share it at your department. Because when we get training built up, we're able to help everything else. When you're a high-functioning team, you train a lot, your disciplinary issues go down, your morale issues go up. So we're increasing morale, we're decreasing disciplinary issues, and we're reigniting that passion that can make a difference in somebody's life. So yep. from the initial concept of the company, we went and we grew. We got like-minded instructors from out, throughout the country. We have 18 instructors in the state of Ohio right now that work together. And they all have to be like-minded. They are all brought on. They have to come out and assist with a couple classes, and then the entire team votes to whether if they feel that person is a good fit for us or not. I stay out of it. I don't have a vote. I don't have a say. I let the team decide if they want to invite them into our family and be part of this. That's very interesting. I, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, when you talk about the dedication, is uh, a good friend of this podcast, he's been a guest on the show, uh, Lieutenant Jason Liska, um, also a Fools member, uh, Jason just add on, I'm glad to have him back doing his podcast, the can man radio show. And he had a firefighter from right here in Broward County, Maddie Johnson on his, this most recent podcast who lived a fast, fast and dangerous life as a firefighter early on, uh, took a severe toll on his health to the point where he needed a liver transplant and he's back. He's back and working again as a firefighter now if yes and he admits about all his fo foibles but we're not here to discuss that we're talking about this man who got the second chance and he's back to what he really loves doing which is taking care as a firefighter of the people in his dis in his district with his with his department and you know as you just said there are other people they may talk the talk uh, especially on social media. And we know that, you know, social media is like a great ghost town of all these ghosts that say, I'm a firefighter, I'm a paramedic, I'm a police officer, and I do it this way. Mm -hmm. Until we find out that a lot of them aren't really real 
And so that's why it's ghosts. Uh, but the fact is that when we have dedication, like you show and your team, and just listening to, to the podcast that Matty was on, talking about his life, how he knew what he, you know, how he ran a, a very dangerous lifestyle early on that was part of the world, the firefighting world. And we know it is. Mm -hmm. We know, we all know people, um, you know, even though I go back, you know, 50 years. Yeah, we had people wild and crazy who were in our department. And uh, we kind of hope they didn't make those calls. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think that this between the two of you, I think uh, two of the strongest, strongest dedications to work that I've heard and seen in a long, long time. We hear a lot of on social media, on podcasts, that there are others just like that, that way of thinking. And then we have the others who it's just a job to them. Mm -hmm. um, and I guess probably that's, you know, Ohio has a lot of volunteer departments and mixed departments now, of course, with how, how it changed so much. And it's funny that when I did live in uh, Cincinnati, way back when, in uh, that was 76, 77, I didn't even realize at the time I was just where I was living was right around the corner from Loveland Sims. Mm -hmm. And there was, there was a guy down there who I didn't get to know then, but I got to know afterwards through firehouse magazine. And that was chief Billy Goldfeder, who has also been uh, a great, I don't know. I've tried to learn as much as I could from the days he was writing every, every uh, issue of a firehouse, but also another great leader in the fire service who says carried that same message that you do. And that many is, is that this is a job that you have to be dedicated to. And it can't be, well, I'm interested on Wednesdays and Fridays, but I'm not really interested on Sundays. You can't do that. You're in for a penny in for a pound. And if you're going to be there and you value who you are and what you're doing for your community, then you need to participate and train like a life depends on it because I can't give you the actual odds, but let's just say often that's going to be the case. Absolutely. Uh, it doesn't matter how long you've been on the job, the decisions we are making on scenes in route to scenes in our training response guidelines, everything like that. Lives are on the line. They're depending on us to make the right decisions. And not only will we not be able to always make a difference to be able to save a life. But when we make decisions, we make choices, we have to live with the consequences for that decision the rest of our life. So our decisions have real implications. And this is, can be a very, very long career to where you can be two weeks out from getting your EMT or your paramedic certification, and you're put in a place to make a decision. And your decision may be the difference when that, that person lives or dies. That call ends within 30 minutes to an hour, but the effects of that call last the rest of your life. And that's the reality that people need to accept and they need to be willing to invest back into. The only way that you can invest back into is training, getting outside of your department, investing back into your career so you're ready to make the best decision that you can at that time so you know you can live with that decision the rest of your life. Right. And I think that's a very, very important fact because we're dealing right now with a, a terrible spate of uh, firefighter suicides uh, in the last several months. Uh, and we, you know, about five and a half, six years ago, we launched a behavioral health initiative shortly after the cancer initiative. And the cancer initiative got picked up almost universally. But it seems that the behavioral uh, initiative is not getting as much press as it needs to. And, and you've said it, and we've talked about this on, on this podcast before, that if you're going to be in this business, there will be calls. With, again, no matter how you serve your community, but there will be calls that you will remember for the rest of your life. And not always with fondness. 
And uh, my buddy who I met uh, in the fire service in our fire department back in 77, he's still my best friend today, uh, came by last week to drop in and visit. And whenever he's here visiting, we talk about rehash several of the calls that we went on. And he was a kid. He was 18 when I first met him and I was 25, but there were several calls that we went on together that have had a lasting impact, negative impact on both of us. But we either talk, we usually talk on the phone maybe once every two weeks anyway, but it's when we're together that we really go over them and talk about, talk them out so that we can say we're clearing our mind. We did, we know as we reviewed, and we've, we've gone back to a couple of, car fires, stuff like that. We reviewed every single step that we went through. Mm -hmm. And anybody who says, oh, that was a tough call, but I don't remember the details. That's BS. I'm sorry. If you if you had a really tough call, like an entrapment with fire, you'll remember that call the rest of your life, no matter Absolutely. how it turned out. Mm -hmm. But you're going to want it to turn out for the very best that's possible. And again, let's say, to be honest and fair, not every outcome is going to be what it, what we want it to be or what we aimed for it to be. There are matters that are beyond our control. Mm -hmm. And we and it's tough. It's very tough to accept that. But to be an effective first responder in any of the three levels, you have to be willing to accept that mm -hmm. as a possibility as well. And Absolutely. you have to be willing to share it. That's the key. I think the biggest thing affecting us is there's still a huge stigma with mental health yeah. are we getting better with that yes are we where we need to be absolutely not and a lot of it's different resources we partner a lot with blake's nanette with next run uh, actually one of our classes we're doing in september the proceeds from that are being donated to them uh, we've had several suicides in our area especially in the last six months we had two within 48 hours from the same department and it all starts with conversations. We have to take the stigma away from mental health issues. We have to be able to start those conversations. We have to be able to have those hard conversations with the people that we work with and with ourselves. We have to understand that it's okay to not be okay, that it's okay to get help and to be able to have resources. Now, there's stigmas with resources that are handed by departments because some departments have issues with reporting where people are fearful of their job and everything else that goes with it. But there are so many resources that are outside of your agency available to you that that shouldn't be something that somebody has to worry about. That we need to start having the conversations at the dining room table, get that kitchen table conversations going on the bump or the apparatus after these bad calls, letting the guys know, here, if you're having issues, call this number. Your department's not going to find out what's going on, but there's a resource to get the help that you need. That we understand that trauma is cumulative. This stuff is going to build up over your career and it will take a toll on you one way or another. Whether it leads to a role of alcohol issues, alcohol dependency, drug dependency, stress, divorces, lashing out while you're at home and everything else. No matter how good that you think that you're bearing the stuff down it's going to find a way to get out and you have to be able to recognize that we have to find healthy ways to be able to deal with this and cope with it so we can reduce these suicides so we can stop it because the job is dangerous enough we don't have to we shouldn't have to be scared that we're going to lose a friend while they're sitting at home because they had issues with the thoughts the depression we have so many resources available, so many people out there dedicating everything that they are to reduce this, that we need to take the stigma away. We need to make it known that it's okay to have these issues and to get help to fix them. That's an important point. And I, I think what I'd like to do, I'm going to take a moment right now and let you know, folks, that if you're listening and you do have these questions and you have these concerns, I'm just going to give you two two uh, places that you can reach out to. One is fbha.org, the Firefighter Behavioral Health Alliance. And that's Jeff Dill, a great friend of the podcast. He's been on several times. We're looking for another uh, new date to come. He'll join us again. And also, anyone who wears a badge can uh, text, send a text 
uh, the word the word badge to the number seven four one seven four one. Now these are just two that we're able to share with you, but there, as Chris just said, there are many more out there. But you, as he also mentioned, that you can't be afraid of being afraid. Fear is what brought us to where we are today as humanity. Mm -hmm. But we also know that if we keep that little bit of fear tucked in, away inside when we're doing it, that, as I was taught way back when, that will help us be a little bit more careful. It's like that little edge that we need. It's there. It's not the forefront of our mind, but just keep it there to remember that you got to be a little bit more careful with this job than you can just doing, you know, a, a grass fire. You know, mm -hmm. some jobs require a little bit more direct attention, uh, direct intervention, getting your hands dirty, getting in there, digging in, a cliff rescue, a bad entrapment, working fire with people still trapped in the house. All of those we know are dangerous and we have to keep that in mind, but we're still going to go do our jobs because that's what we were mm -hmm. trained for. And it's okay to have that little doubt in the back. And that does is not a sign that you're losing your bravery and you can't be a firefighter anymore, which I've seen a couple of posts on uh, that you should step away. That's what somebody said to someone who had posted that. I still have these, some of these things that bother me, some of these calls. Some of them then step away. That's the worst thing you could tell that person to do. Mm -hmm. You got to embrace them and say, hey, we're here. We're here to help you. Tell us what you need. We'll 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 find if we can't do it. We'll find somebody who can help you in your area or your phone or on Zoom. And you know, with now electronic and, and telehealth and other programs, you don't even have to walk into an office. You can do it from the comfort of your own home on your couch at your time when you're ready to sit and talk about it. And that's the message we need to also share with our brothers and sisters that you're not alone. Most mm -hmm. of us on this job will have calls that either will frighten us a bit or really have a tough impact on us. That's what this job brings. If you didn't know that when you came on board, I'm not sure whose fault that is. It might be a little bit on both sides. But the fact is that being a law enforcement officer, being a firefighter, and even being an EMT paramedic is not without its dangers. And most of us step up when we make the, the, the choice and we tuck it away. You know, I remember going to high level uh, rescue training and I was an acrophobic since I was five years old. Hated heights, never liked them. By the end of that class, I came down twice from six stories off the roof, one as a victim, one as a rescuer. Learned how to repel. Uh, before we had harnesses, that we made our own harnesses out of the ropes. Uh, probably, you might remember those. Mm -hmm. A little uncomfortable when you cinch them tight, but because uh, <laughs> where those knots are. But that's what we had in those days. So that's what I learned it on. Mm -hmm. Today, it's much safer. We have great harnesses, great brakes, uh, safety brakes on these harnesses as well. Not a guarantee, but it's still the job we have to do that we're, we're trying to be on. So how have you found, and then after this, we'll take the break. How have you found people receive your, your philosophy of citizens first? Honestly, it depends on where you're going. Uh, some areas are extremely welcoming and wanting to bring stuff in. Um, some believe that it's just talk until they sit through our classes, they sit and actually truly learn what our message is, what we're talking about and everything else. And honestly, at that point, they tend to open up, they welcome us in. Uh, we have a few departments that are bringing us in for their quarterly trainings. So we are regularly going in training with these departments. We have some departments that are sending students to every class that we're doing. So that way they can get more and more of their people. So we're getting a lot of buy-in to it, and which is good. Uh, you do have some chief officers, 
some company officers, some senior guys, some guys getting ready to retire that don't quite buy into it, that uh, they're still in that safety culture generation and that they're not truly healer, hearing what our message is. We're not talking about anything reckless. We're not talking about suicide tactics, anything else. We're talking about breeding competent and aggressive firemen that are going to make decisions on calls that are going to use their training, their experience, and their ability to go in and make a difference in somebody's life. There's nothing reckless about it. There's a complete difference in the definition of reckless and aggressive. And that's one of the things that we're trying to educate people on. I want aggressive firemen. I don't want reckless firemen. And how we get through that is training, competency, and experience. Right. And I think that some people are still of the mind where well, if it worked this way once, it's going to work this way all the time. And that just doesn't doesn't fly out. I, I had a, a wonderful guest on this show, uh, former deputy chief in the town that I grew up. I didn't know him when I was living there. It's now a city outside of Boston. And he's been on the show a couple of times. And uh, a couple of years ago, when there was a lot of banter on social media about aggressive firefighting or are you just going to let it let it burn, yeah, going back and forth. So I asked, I asked Chief Burns, I said, Chief, how would you look at that? How do you find it? He goes, Steve, he says, I have two words for you. Three words. It all depends. He says, I could go on a call 11 o'clock at night at 125 Main Street for a working fire. I get there, first, do, first company's in, they report everybody's out of the house, all the animals are out of the house. Uh, where the fire is, and as soon as I set, come in and park and set up my IC, then I'm ready to give them, you know, where I go, where they go from there. Mm -hmm. I said, he says, but if two nights later I'm at 129 Main Street and there's only two people out and they think there are two kids still lost in the building and pets in there, and they're not, they can't find grandma. He says, I'm going to make a totally different attack on that call than I am. I did the 148 hours earlier. So mm -hmm. he said, Steve, the smart firefighter, the smart incident commander will always know it depends. And he said, and said, he said the same thing, not reckless behavior, mm -hmm. you know, but we have to do the right thing at the right time for the right situation. Mm -hmm. And that's what we do. And I think that you just made that absolutely clear that the organization and your aim is not to put firefighters in reckless uh, danger. Absolute, ra rather, just the opposite. You want them to do their jobs to the best of their ability with as little danger as possible. Yeah, we reduce a lot of the dangers and the unknowns by training by getting experience, by building that competency level up to be professionals, whether you're volunteer or career, none of that crap matters. It's what you're putting into the job is what makes you a professional or not. And some people may not be going to fires every week, every day, every shift they work where they may get a couple of fires a year, but they still have to fill that gap. And the only way to fill that gap of experience is through realistic training conditions. And that's what we're trying to help with. Right. And that that's so important today because there's so many different things that are burning today. We're talking about a fire situation. Mm -hmm. And we have different ways of firefighting today than we did when I was a firefighter. We have class A foam, class B foam, class C foam. We still have uh, a, the new versions of AFFF. Thank goodness the new versions um, that are safe for us to use. And we have to somehow be able to work with all of those at any moment. Mm -hmm. And But you're not going to train on those every week, those same things every week. There's going to be lots of training on lots of different aspects of the job. So how do you fill it in? How do you fill in those gaps? And that's mm -hmm. the key. And, we're, and one of the things that we promoted on this with our, with our guests who do these kind of programs is that go, go to one of the programs, find out mm -hmm. if it's going to be in your community or if it's going to be even 
near your community. If it's going to be away, maybe you can get some, one or two other firefighters to go with you. And all three of you sign up and you travel together. So you split the cost. It's not anywhere near as expensive as one person going. And you get to learn with nobody else but other firefighters. Mm -hmm. That's one of the huge benefits of the Fool's Chapters. No matter where you are in the country, there's going to be a Fool's Chapter in your region, in your state, operating, doing something. These are extremely great trainings put on at extremely low costs. Go to them. They will welcome you with open arms just to train, to give back, and take that information back to your department. Share it. We have a chief officer of the department looking at increasing their outside training budget that's coming and supervising one of our class at MAFC this year, just so he can see from his end what the benefits are of doing it. And I welcome that stuff. I want to get chief officer involved. I want to be able to get training officers involved where they see the benefits of these outside trainings to invest back in because we know training budgets are the first thing that gets cut when it's time to crunch the numbers. And it's one of the worst things that we can do because that's taking our investment of our members away. We have to get back to them. We have to train them. We have to invest into them so they stay with their agency. That's a good point. Plus the fact that we know that many communities receive funds from insurance companies uh, and other agencies if uh, based on the uh, real estate in your community and what the taxes are for your state. And some, sometimes, like in the state of New York, and I know Pennsylvania has it as well, that a certain amount of money that you pay towards your percentage of your homeowner's insurance will go to um, funnel to the fire department in, mm -hmm. in your community. And that's, a, that's at a state level, not just, we're not talking about just your local you know, town or, or city or village. This is on state levels. And mm -hmm. the New York State at that time, when I was in upstate New York, had that the 2% rule where if you purchased your homeowner's insurance from a company that was not based in the state of New York, then they pay 2% of that premium back to that was donated then to the fire departments. And that was, it was limited. I mean, we could buy equipment, we could buy uh, uni, um, uh, uh, turnout gear, radios, stuff like that um, with that, those, those funds. And so you have you understand also then as a firefighter in your communities that there is money coming back that might help you go to some of these classes as well. Mm -hmm. And that's not necessarily out of the pocket of your department. Mm -hmm. So that's another way of looking at enhancing your training by going to outside events because it doesn't always have to cost you an arm and a leg and it doesn't necessarily have to be a huge expense from, from your department as well, because some of it can be underwritten. And I think that's something that if you're not sure about your department, what they can do, ask a chief officer uh, what how it may work with them mm -hmm. and see if that will benefit members of the department to go to various training sessions, especially a fool's training, uh, fool's training session in their community or in their state or in their region. Mm -hmm. uh, because as as Chris is telling us, there are, we know if you're in the fire service, you know there are fools chapters all over the country and not just one per state. I mean, I know of at least three or four in the state of Florida. Um, there's the Southeast one, is Southeast America one in Georgia. They're, they're just all over the place. And mm -hmm. the fact is, it's not something that you're going to, oh, I have to search. I don't know anybody. So what? So what? Yeah. I, I bet you'd go to, I bet you you would go to, either Firehouse Expo or FDIC by yourself, if you were getting it paid for, even if you weren't gonna, if you didn't know anybody there, you would wanna go to those to learn from there and be with other firefighters. Well, guess what? You don't have to go as far, you don't have to pay as much, find the Fool's Chapter in your community or in your area, and you can get terrific training through that Fool's organization without having to maybe schlep a long way and pay a huge sum out of your pocket for it because you can learn from other firefighters. Now, will it match 100% what your department is doing? Not necessarily, but it doesn't have to because it's the philosophy first that Chris is underscoring. 
And I think that's what's most important is the philosophy you bring to the table. And I guarantee if you don't know anybody going into that class, when you leave that fool's class, you are going to have more brothers and sisters when you leave that you have net networked with, which is going to be one of the biggest returns on your investment. That networking is critical as you go through your career and will help so much. So you don't have to know anybody as you go in, but when you leave, you're going to know people that you can call and ask questions no matter what day of the week it is. That's so important. I was invited back in 2017 to the first kind of re rebirth of the Great Florida Fire School. And my friend who was the uh, director of the education program invited me. He'd been a guest on the show and he said, I would like to come out to the conference. Um, he goes, I, you know, and uh, just hang around and shoot some photos and videos for us. I said, yeah, sure. Love it. And he came to, and I had a, I got there Saturday and kicked off really Monday and Tuesday. He came, he found me in the hotel lobby and he put his arm around me. And he said, uh, he says, so do you feel like you're a firefighter again? And I said, yeah, I really do. He says, good. That's the real reason why I brought you back here. Mm -hmm. Because I knew it. I could hear it whenever we talked on the phone or we did the interview. He goes, I knew how much you miss it. And mm -hmm. uh, he goes, I want you to be back here. And I, I have, I have friends today that I met that first conference um, that we're still friends. We still connect almost, almost every week on social media or a phone call because of that, just because of me being there to take pictures and shoot a few videos. I met these other great firefighters who accepted me. Yeah. I was a senior, senior, senior guy, but they still accepted me there and made me feel a part of the, the family once again. And to me, the, other than a save, there's nothing more rewarding than mm -hmm. knowing, really feeling that you belong to that second family. Absolutely. Because that's what they are. I mm -hmm. mean, um, I, have a, I have an article that has been submitted to uh, one of the, the trades about acting like we're really a family. It's great to toss around the words, but... Mm -hmm. We have to really be there as a family is there. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that when we'll, we'll come back. We'll take a break right now. We'll talk about that a little bit when we get back. But folks, if you're listening to the video, you won't see anything different. If you're listening to the audio, well, you know that we'll take a couple of minutes break. There'll be a couple of public service announcements. Then we'll be right back with our guest today, Chris Kessinger from Citizens First Fire Training. So as always, please stay tuned and we'll be right back. Hello and welcome back to this episode of Five Alarm Task Force. I'm your host, Steve Green. With me is my guest, Chris Kessinger. He is the founder of Citizens First Fire Training. You may say, well, of course, Citizens are First. They call us. We don't just go to the house and wait for them to have an emergency. Yes, you're right. We don't wait for them to call. But when they do call, are we as prepared as we really need to be? Are we as prepared as we should be. Well, that's what Chris and his team have been working on for uh, 17 and a half years on the part-time because he was still working with the fire department. And now he has since gone uh, full-time with Citizens First. And if you've heard the first segment, you know that he has shared so much of that philosophy and the reasoning and thinking behind it that it really is a clear picture. One of the things we talked about just before we went to the break is the concept of family. We have used the term family in the fire service for years and years and years. It used to be the brotherhood. And as more and more women have joined our ranks, then it's, we use a family. We call our brothers and sisters, but we're a family, just like any other family. Do we always get along? No. Do families have arguments and spats? Yes, plenty. But that doesn't mean that we lose the love, which is the basis for our family bonds, is that love that we share. If you're a firefighter, I'm going to go out and limb and say, for the most part, I think you love this job that we do, whether, again, career volunteer makes no difference. We love what we do. But if we're going to use the word family, 
We must make that word count. You can't just banter it about. And just like you can't just tell somebody, well, I might use the jaws to get you out. I don't know. Maybe I'll just bring the come along over. We'll do that. No, you're going to choose the action that's going to be most appropriate for the emergency to extricate that patient, get them out as quickly and as safely as you possibly can. You don't wing it. And that's what Citizens First Fire Training is all about. Not that we're, tra we're training our citizens first. We are training ourselves to remember that our citizens come first. We are obligated to take care of them. So with this concept of family, your community, not just your department, is part of your family. Sometimes we don't live in the community where our department is. We know that, that that's occur, but you're still part of their family. The people who live in that community will see you as family. And you have to remember though, that families sometimes do have these spats. Doesn't mean it's over and done with, it just means it's spats. So let's be careful because from the newest probie to the senior firefighter in a house, we're still family. Yeah, we might rag on the probie a little bit, okay? And we may go easy on the senior firefighter a little bit. Why? We're all firefighters. We all do basically the same job. We all come up the same way. Some of us then go on to become drivers. Some of us go on to be officers. Some of us go on to be chiefs. And some just like to spend their 20, 25, 30 years being a firefighter. And there's nothing wrong with that either because they love the job they're doing and they want to be able to continue to do that. So with the concept of family in mind, Chris, I want you to take us back those 19 years nearly. What was the jumping off point for you that brought you to saying, I need to do something more for the firefighting to, to we, we're better serving our citizens? Honestly, uh, I'd been in a dry spell in the career. I got complacent. I wasn't really doing what I needed to be doing. And I got to know a few guys and I went to a fool's training out of state and I took two of my guys from my crew. We all went, we trained, had a great weekend. And honestly, that's what ignited my passion. That's what got me going back into the trainings, trying to attend anything and everything that I could and seeing that same passion reignite with the guys that went with me, that we were able to bring that back, get that going with other guys in the department and other people that they knew. It's really motivating. So being able to go to an outside source, see the guys that were there, uh, there were no egos. It was all just humble firemen wanting to spread the knowledge that they've acquired over their careers, give back and spread that. It was, a, it was an amazing feeling. So it was career changing for me and I'm forever thankful for that, being able to go there. And it's put me into a place to where I am now to be able to help and give back as well. But that was the biggest thing is just taking that first step, going to that outside training with the Fool's Chapter and everything else has been written since. Okay, so when the three of you came back from that training session, and I'm sure on the way back, you guys were talking, talking it over, talking it over, what can we do? That was great. That was great. How do we do something here to, to better prepare ourselves for what our jobs are? How, uh, when you the three of you got back and you brainstormed on the ride home, how uh, how did you bring it to the department and, and share it with them? And what was their first uh, reaction? Uh, their first reaction is always to shut it down. That was their biggest thing is you don't need to do that here. That's not how we've always done it. Typical mantras that you get. So being their company officer, we were able to bring everything. We started making changes on our company, on our shift, our day to begin with. And then when other people started working our day, whether it be on overtime, shift trades, everything else, they started seeing what we were doing. We were giving them the why of what we were doing, how it was making us better, how it was making it better for the people we were serving. And we started getting buy-in from there. And then as we started getting buy-in from there, we were able to do a little bit more big systemic changes. That's great. So those of you listening, if you think, 
Well, my my uh, department will never go for that. Don't jump to conclusions. Mm -hmm. Don't jump to conclusions. You you your department might be more open to the idea of seeing somebody who has this gung ho attitude and like the idea and say, okay, if you think it's worthwhile, let's give it a try. You're going to be the one in charge. And that's what Chris and his two pals did. And it paid off. Their department, I, I, they still, I take it they're still, they still maintain that philosophy. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people there still do. I mean, you still have some people that don't, but you're not going to always be able to win everybody over. Right. But I think the biggest thing that you can do is to bring the why you want to make a change, how it will benefit the department, how it benefits the community and all the members. If we bring the why and we educate them on that, we also have to be cognizant of how we are delivering that message. We just come in guns a blazing saying that how we've been doing it's wrong. Everything we've done is stupid and it doesn't work. And this is the best way to go. We may not be able to win those people over. Sometimes you have to make it their idea, but we all have to be able to bring a humble message of the why. And this is what I want to try. This is what I want to do. And this is how it'll pay off. So some, and I've not always been the best of it myself, but we have to look at how we're delivering the message so we don't shut them down from the beginning. Right. Right. You, you and I have a mutual friend, Mark Slefkowski, mm -hmm. uh, the co-founder of the Nesta Bar. Mm -hmm. And when Mark approached me four years ago now, I think, four or five years ago, he told me he was going to be down here. He wanted to tell me about this new tool. And I said, well, I'm not a firefighter anymore. Why would I? He goes, because you were a firefighter. I want. And he came in and he brought like half a dozen models of the Nesta Bar to me. And as soon as I looked at it, with the one with the, the even the double rocker, I said, holy crap, I can think of like a dozen calls I could have used something like that on. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I'm so glad you said that. And I said, why? Any firefighter would say that. He goes, no, that's the problem. They're not saying that. They say, well, you know, we got the Halligan already and we got a pry bar already. And you're absolutely right. Almost every engine company or truck company has a pry bar and a Halligan on it. But on the other hand, how many times do you go to use the pry bar in the Halligan, but you still need some cribbing to get the fulcrum point set? Because mm -hmm. you don't have enough strength on the point to, with the lever to work. Well, this tool comes with the bar and the rocker attached to it. So Mark has worked really hard to try to show the fire service that this, is, this could be a good tool. You know, he, was, he sent one to you. Uh, mm -hmm. I believe. And he told me that, you know, you really told him that you really liked it. You saw the, the promise on it. But other most other departments say, well, we, we know what we have. We got it already. And I and that's really just really that same mindset you just talked about is that, yeah, we've had a Helgen bar for over 50 years. So that's, a, that's what we need. Wait a second. You took Jaws of Life instead of using a, a port of power. We all used port of power back in my day. We didn't, the jaws were just coming out at that point in time in the 70s. So we all used come alongs and port of powers. But wait a second, you said we could get a, a Hirsch tool or one of the other brand names of a pneumatic tool? Oh my God, that would be amazing. Okay, it was, it was great. And it allowed us to do a lot more work, get people out. But there are other tools that come out since you know we have new nozzles that have come out uh new diameters of hose mm -hmm. you know, now we have five inch l you know ldh you know my day three and a half was that's the big one that was three and a half inch feet of line that was the big one we had everything changes and evolves so mm -hmm. we as firefighters have to be able to continue and evolve our departments have to continue to evolve because what happens when we don't evolve and you start, you start mentioning, you didn't say the word, I'm going to use the word, we become stale. Mm -hmm. If we, in the same rut, every day, every call, we just do the same thing like robots, we do a disservice to the people we're supposed to be serving. 
Absolutely. So how do we, how, let me, not we, where did you see your success that even, even with other departments, not just fools groups who, who loved what you were doing, but other departments who said, wait a second, that's kind of smart. We could use that. How did you get those departments to even consider, consider that new process for them? Honestly, it all started with conversation. Uh, a lot of the times we'll talk with the chiefs, training officers, company officers, and senior men of that department. And if they're coming to us asking questions, it's typically because something has happened. They've identified an issue or something went wrong on a call or they're realizing that they need to make a change. And the big thing is with our trainings is we don't have a one size class that fits all. We get in, we look at the response guidelines, we look at their staffings, we try to get to truly know the department and we develop our classes specifically for them. So I don't have just a general class that goes out there for anything that we're going to do. I ask a lot of questions. We get to know the department. We get to go know the region that they're going with, their mutual aid companies. And we want to custom tailor the classes for them so they get more return on their investment out of them. What a brilliant idea. Instead of same, taking the same package to every department, you find out what they need and mm -hmm. feed the need. Absolutely. That's a model I don't remember seeing anywhere else in the fire service or with any of the guests I've had on the show. N never talked about it that way, that we mm -hmm. want to give you what you tell us you need. Not We're not going to tell you what we need because we're not your department. So tell mm -hmm. us, how can we help you? Where are your shortcomings? What do you need bolster bolstering for? And you custom tailor a package to them. Mm -hmm. That's something we didn't share that first. I'm amazed with that. That's phenomenal. That so is we have, outside the box. Yeah, we have ideas. We have recommendations that we make to them as we go through the process. But it's an open conversation from both sides. So we're identifying issues that they may not see. And we're bringing solutions along with that that they can actually implement. That's... Again, it's very refreshing because it's part of what you said at the very beginning that you let them reach out to you and and then see what, what they need you for. And then you feed that need. And when you're done, you've given that department exactly what it asked for. And mm -hmm. in the you didn't try to do cover every working uh, structure fire, every car accident, sorry, collision, we don't call them accidents anymore because very few are. Um, but you're giving them something tailored just for them. And you might go three weeks later to a department five miles away, but you're going to be doing a different program based on what they need, not what you just did on the neighboring department. And I think that's something that we really do not see. We see a lot of ads on in social media, um, this meeting, this regional conference and that like that, but they're already packaged. They're already packaged. You come around and you say, what do you need? Tell, tell me what you need and we'll make a package for you. That is absolutely unique, I think, in this field. And I really commend you and the team for it because that is the way that, number one, I think you will entice a department to be interested in working with you. And number two, if those firefighters see that it's their department is trying to help them with a custom package of education, then they'll have a better buy-in for it because, hey, that's what we've been talking about. They're going to bring that in they're bringing that in for us. That's what we told them we needed. And that's going to get to be that impetus for them to say, yeah, we're, let's get some other people to go to this with us, you know, come to this program with us. And I think that helps you folks stand out as really excellent tutors. It reminds me really what, what Andy does. 
with the FLIRs, mm -hmm. you know, with with the uh, the infrared cameras. He customizes lessons based on the cameras that a department is using. And he mm -hmm. has access to so many of them so he can cover that as opposed to saying, well, no, I'm here to sell you this one. No, he doesn't. He doesn't sell a thing. He just comes in and answers their questions, what they need for their department and their equipment. And I think that if we can get more educators in the fire service, I, I tell you the truth, fire service, law enforcement, any uh, EMS who will take that approach to share knowledge, I think there'd be a lot more buy-in in general. Why not? Absolutely. Why would I not want to be part? Why saying this is my department and they're doing, they asked us to tell them what we wanted and they're giving it to us. Why would I wouldn't, why would I not buy into that? Absolutely. And it gives them a way to make it actually feasible to implement. Because we can go in and we can do a full advanced tech rescue class, full rope class, everything else. But if they don't have the equipment, the funding, and the capability to implement it, how is that beneficial to them? Right. So if we bring in equipment that they have access to that they can get, or we can assist with grants with them to be able to get that equipment and how to use the equipment that they have to make it the most beneficial for them, it's a win. So we have to be realistic in how we're doing. So we have to be able to give them the means to make what they have or what they can get work for them. That makes so much sense. And it's so refreshing because, well, I, I just think that with the situation of, of the our fire service today, you know, as you said earlier, most departments are short staffed. Um, our friends, uh, Nick Peppard and uh, Sean Duffy always talk about make do. Uh, make do with what you have because whether you have full manning on an engine company or a truck company or you're down to three people or even two, if the fire call comes in, you still, got to, you still have to respond. So you're going to have to make do with what you have. And until somebody else gets there, your first arrival, you're going to have to make do. And I think what you're providing is to these departments you're providing them for some of the the problems that they're having or they want to learn more about you're providing them those steps to increase their knowledge about a particular tactic or thought process or so, how to handle this or that as opposed to coming in again you know guns blazing saying we're here to teach you this and if you don't care about that then you can walk out that door because it just doesn't make sense. And I think what you guys do is is really just serving up uh, some of the best education that a department needs because they say they need it. They're willing to admit that they need help in training. And that's a, it's a hard first step for many departments and for many chiefs. Doesn't mean that you're department has failed in its training it doesn't mean that you failed as a leader it just means that things are changing and to we have to be willing to learn how those changes affect us and what we do with them you know we didn't always have big box stores so firefighting in department stores and other stores were was, was a lot easier now with big box stores and the loads that they carry and sprinkler systems that sometimes work, sometimes didn't. You know, we we saw the couple of big box stores that they had sprinkler uh, systems that didn't go off or weren't able to contain the fire. So we still have to know just the very basic of put the wet stuff on the red stuff. But there's a way, there might be a better way to do it based on certain situations. Mm -hmm. And that's, so if they have one in their in their uh, vicinity that's part of their response district, then there are classes that they can say, hey, how do we do this? Well, how do we do this better? Because, you know, how do we do mutual aid better? How do we do automatic aid? You know, now being Ohio, you guys in the central part of the state have some of the, between you and Illinois, the, Indiana, you guys have these great mutual aid. It begins with an M, I think is your... Uh, is the, the word the word for it, but um, the mutual aid systems for these boxes that 
you guys automatically respond to with each other. And uh, some communities have Greater Boston does from Boston out west till till about uh, the w Newton Wellesley line, uh, I believe, and that's Greater Boston. Both that's west, and then you go north towards the North Shore and south towards the South Shore of Boston. And that's the one I grew up listening to and, and visiting many times. But I think that today, I think it's incumbent upon fire departments, especially with the status of our fire service today, to work harder to make sure that we have either automatic aids or good mutual aid packs with our neighbors to make sure that we can, we can take care of each other. Absolutely. And I think that all starts with the beginning of losing our egos, leaving the ego at the door and realizing that we're much better as a team than we are individually. And if we start getting those mutual aid agreements going, we leave the egos at the door. We're able to be better for the entire region that we're serving. That's a great, a great point. Um, I know that um, some of some of, a good number of the chiefs I've had, I've been lucky to have some wonderful chiefs on this show over the years. And many of them talk about the idea that, same thing about the egos. He says, uh, egos should play no part in mutual aid or auto aid. The only thing that should play, have any impact is how are we protecting the people of our community? Mm -hmm. And what's the best way to protect them? So if we know that on a weekday, we may only get four or five people turning out on, at four o'clock in the afternoon. We need to activate, if, depending on the type of call, have auto aid come in and be doing it. And mm -hmm. they've all talked about that. There, are, there is no room for, uh, for egos when we're talking about the life safety of our communities. Absolutely. Nobody cares when they're calling 911 what the side of your truck says. They just expect the people there to perform, to fix whatever the issue is. And honestly, we are sometimes our biggest blocking of that. It's oh, just yeah. getting past all that and being able to accept the fact that, hey, we need your help. You're going to need our help in the future. If we start working together as a team, we start training together. We perform better when working together. Oh, that's so true. I learned that firsthand as, as, a, as a rookie. We had two stations. We 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 um, every month we did our we did two trainings. Uh, two weeks were trainings, and then was our business meeting, and then we also did training sometimes on that fourth week with other departments in our county area, mm -hmm. so we could work with them. Our in those days our chief was a specialist with AFFF. We had a huge, large, finished product. Uh, uh, petroleum farm right next to the airport. I'm not sure why all these major cities put those right next to the airports, but it seems to be very common. Uh, Boston has them, New York has them. But the fact is that when you're in that situation, you really, as you said, you really don't care what it says on the side of the apparatus. You want to make sure you have enough apparatus and enough people to mitigate the problem that you were called for in the first place. And I think that if we can spread that idea, and if you, our faithful listeners and our viewers on a YouTube channel, take this back to your department and share it with your friends, your colleagues, your families, your fire families, share it with them, that you have the ability to, you always have the ability to get better. No, one's, no one will ever take that away. It's you have to make the choice that you want to avail yourself of the opportunity because the opportunities are there. And uh, we're also, by the way, going to include uh, Chris's contact information in the uh, show notes. We'll also put in the show notes the uh, text number I gave you for Behavioral Health Initiative and the link to the um, Fiverr Health Behavior Alliance. We'll give you that their information as well. But you should feel free to reach out to Chris and the organization to help you with a demo, uh, a training session for your department um, and being part of the Fools, one of the Fools chapters up there in Ohio. We got several right down here in South Florida as well. And 
You can go right up the state, right up the coastline on both sides of the peninsula, and you'll see fools uh, organizations all around the state of Florida. And I love reading the, the social media posts from those conferences because they're always positive. They're positive about the training they go through and they're positive about the camaraderie they make on those. And I have no doubt that every time your, your team goes out, you and your team go out, and when you finish your, your program, I will bet that almost every single one, every single firefighter who is there, no matter their rank, comes to you guys and thanks you for an amazing program and what not just your program, but what you did to help that department. Absolutely. And that's one of the biggest things is we want to invest back into the departments. We're not just asking them to invest in us. We want to be a part of their departments. We want to help and truly give back and invest back into them. And I think that's what helps your organization stand out from so many others because it's a two-way street. And those of you in far, far between to see in this business. Um, we certainly don't, we have some, with some of our uh, manufacturers are wonderful about that. Mm -hmm. They're terrific. And some of them, well, I guess they didn't care because we still got PFA, PFAS in our gear. Uh, so no matter what else we do, whatever, whatever we fight, um, whether it's a, a um, hazmat situation or working structure fire, or house fire, whatever it is, we, we're willing to risk our lives to help take care of our people and our communities and their property. And yet some of the manufacturers don't even care about taking care of the firefighters that they want to respond when they have a, an incident at their factories. Yeah. That's, that's what, that's, a that's sad one of the, yeah, that's one of the nice things about the company that we own is we get to select what companies we're affiliated with. And that's one of the biggest things is, every company that we work with that we sell equipment for and everything else we've invested into beforehand and we've tested their stuff before we offer it but they also partner with firefighters and actually care about what the end users are using and doing so again that's another unique aspect of citizens first that it, you are you're not just taking you're giving back mm -hmm. as well more than just the training yeah, you'll you'll go in and do the training, whichever they needed for you to do. You come and do that, but you don't cut your ties with the department when that's done. You you're always with them one way or another, and you're looking to, if they need help. You're looking to try to help them out and invest back in them. Absolutely. We we don't see that again very often in this in this field. It makes no difference whether it's career or, or volunteer. We just don't see this. We mm -hmm. don't hear about it. Um, there are a few. There are a few ones that are out there to, to do that and give back, but those are few and far between. And I mm -hmm. think it's refreshing to hear that a group of, you know, gnarly, well-seasoned firefighters who love the job they do not only have such a strong, positive impact on a department and its community because of what you do for them, but you have the impact because the the community or that department knows that you're still invested in them. Even when you walk out the door, you're still there to help mm -hmm. them when necessary. Absolutely. And I think that um, that is once again, one of the standout features of, of you and Citizens First. I, I can't tell you how inspiring this interview is again, Chris. Even for me, second time around talking with you, and I, I'm just hoping that each and every one of our listeners and viewers walks away with the right thoughts, the right ideas that this podcast has tried to generate, the information you've so eloquently and yet professionally shared with us about what Citizens First does why you do it, what you do, and how you do it, and your commitment to your clients. Mm -hmm. And that is that is very special. And uh, I cannot thank you enough 
uh, at your tender young age, because you're still younger than me, um, of being, of having the foresight to see how much good we can do as firefighters, both for each other and for our communities and for the fire service as a whole. Because, you know, we know that bad news travels really fast. You know, it's travel fast than a, a fuse going to a, to a big explosion in a, in a mine shaft. But good news, you got to fight to get it out there. Mm -hmm. and it, so, yes, we hear when a firefighter or police officer or an EMT paramedic is messed up. That makes news. That's what sells news, sadly. But every once in a while, there's going to be a good story, an inspiring story, a story that teaches and helps and benefits. And we need to see those carried more frequently in all aspects of media so that people know that, hey, don't just look at the, the bad slip-ups because we all make slip-ups. We all make mistakes. I've made some buttes myself, and I, I will never deny that I've made major mistakes. But we're human, and that's why the good Lord put these on the end of pencils, erases, because we do make mistakes. Mm -hmm. we, we work, most of us work hard to correct them. So my sincere thanks for joining me again. I, I was glad to hear the changes uh, before we started the recording um, and how you've now become full-time with the company. You got this whole crew that works with you, loves the job they're doing, loves to travel, loves to teach. And, you know, as a teacher for so many years and a director of education, boy, I just wish you guys were my students. You know, because these, this is what I try to do. I try to inspire my students to do what, what they learn from me to share that with others as well. Mm -hmm. And um, you guys do that. And you do it very, very well. Um, and even better than last time. So uh, I want to wish you much continued success. Love to see you grow even more. Not, not to what gets out of hand, because I want you to have a firm hand on it. But I just wish you so much success because there's so much that you're offering to a fire service that really needs it now, probably more than ever, because of the numbers and what we're looking at. And not everybody's head is 100% in the game anymore. Uh, all too often, they're buried in our phones and our pa uh, electronic pads. But if we get back to the basics and just try to be the best that we can be and have good teachers to help us do that, I think we can make a better fire service in this country, in our neighbors to the north in Canada, and those who listen around the world could do the same thing as well. They just Absolutely. have to... They want to have, they just need to have it in their hearts and in their minds to do so. You just got to care. That's it. The magic word, you have to care. Well, folks, if you're watching the video, this will be the end. If you're listening to the audio, yes, we'll be back right after our pause. But I do want to, again, extend my sincere thanks to Chris Kessinger with Citizens First, who stresses the fact that our firefighters have to be trained to give the best care to our citizens, our communities, as soon as they're on arrival. And they, they make their size up. They know exactly what needs to be done and how to do it. And they're willing to share that with any department that's interested. And as we said, they will custom tailor the educational part of it to what your needs are. They're not going to barge down your door, walk in, and you have to learn this, 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 and this, or we're not showing up. No. They sit with you. They want to find out what do you need, where's your weaknesses, where's your strengths, what can we do to help you make it better, and then they'll custom design that program for your department and community. That's hard to come by, folks. So we'll put uh, Chris's contacts on the sh in the show notes and our thanks i wish them all the best for a, a very su continued successful and healthy and safe career and uh, we'll be back next week with another episode of five alarm task force until then stay safe stay well 
and take care of each other. Bye-bye now.